We as journalists have been reporting on the appearances of activists, guerrillas, soldiers and policemen before the Truth Commission week after week the last 18 months. But we ourselves could not escape the wide net of the Truth Commission because they are supposed to get as detailed a picture as possible of what went wrong in South Africa's past. For three days this week, the Truth Commission focused on the media during the apartheid years. If we had done our jobs properly, would people today have been able to say about the horrors of apartheid we did not know? Tonight, we report on ourselves. We take a look at the SABC's role as chief propagandist of the state, the police spies who infiltrated newspapers, the experiences of black journalists in a white-dominated environment, and the response of the media bosses. Let's look at the SABC first. Television came to South Africa only in 1976. While the rest of the world was enthralled by the magic box, the National Party government of the 1960s believed television would undermine the morality of the nation. Perhaps they were right. The old SABC did untold damage to our nation through the propaganda that was dished out on the screen. It became not the voice of the people, but his master's voice. Hierdie briljante man vervang die woord apartheid met afsonderlijke ontwikkeling. Die herwonnen vrijheid is nu vijf jaar oud. Een vrijheid wat niet zonder moeite verwerf is nie. This land has indeed been acquired by blood and sweat and tears. All shall not be in vain. The spirit of tenacity of our forefathers is still ours. We are a virile nation. Our young men and women will be in the vanguard of any struggle for existence the future may bring. We have no fear. We love South Africa. This is our land of hope and glory. We shall not fail her or any of those who depend upon us. Be of good cheer. The will to win through is there. We could not do otherwise. We have no other country, no other home. Here we shall stay, whatever the cost. Intussen verskerp Foster sy strijd teen onderminers. Op 11 juli 1963 wordt de topjag op Alte Goudreigse huis in Rwonia uitgevoerd. Baie mense word in echtenis geneem. Vermoor een verstandelijk verstuurde parlementsbode, Dr. Hendrik Frens Vervoer. Die man wat allerwee bestempel was als die vader van Zuid-Afrika. This government will not be intimidated. And instructions have been given to maintain law and order at all costs. Those educational institutions at which blacks are destroying their own amenities will be closed for an indefinite period. in South Africa is more important to me than anything else. There you are. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and welcome by Finance program. Een netwerk Finance, een onderhoud met generaal Johan Koetseer, die commissaris van de Zuid-Afrikaanse politie. Die 
Die generaal is saluut vir die generaal Johan Koetsee, die commissaris van die Suid-Afrikaanse politie. Hy word dikwels beskryf as die vijandse grootste, maar ook mees gerespecteerde vijand. Van Suid-Afrika sy suksesvolste spioene was sy brengkinders. Geheime agente soos Gerard Ludi en Craig Williamson het een jarenlang opgeleid en in groot geheimhouding onderskraag, terwijl hulle communistische partije geinfiltreer en tot in Moskou hul taak uitgevoer het. We'll stop just this moment outside the ANC offices in London. You can see them vaguely, the green offices behind me, uh, over my right shoulder. I was trained in Russia by the Russian soldiers, uh, Russian officers who are training the other. This man, PW, is quite fearless, sometimes to a point that drives his security men to distraction. Threats, bomb scares, even two actual bomb explosions in Paris. But P.W. wants to go for a stroll in the Bois de Boulogne. He's a very neat and a very tidy man. Uh, that is, I suppose, the reason why he always chooses and selects his own clothes. Together through the years, these men and their machines have provided an umbrella of protection and security which has now become virtually redundant. This because successful political processes are removing both the stigma and the suffering of a war which has cast a shadow over Southwest African Namibia for the past 23 years. Mens terug oor die afgelopen twee dagen is dit vooral die geestdrif en vastbeslotenheid van die SAP lede wat getref het. Ons is deel van een wenspan. Elkeen van ons is een belangrijke lid van daar die span. In a multitude of publications, the ANC proudly demonstrates that it is inextricably involved in the business of violence and terrorism. The slogans are, attack, advance, give the enemy no quarter. So it's not surprising that South Africa has not been spared this revolutionary abuse of children for political ends. The use of children to try to fan the flames of violence has increased at an alarming rate over recent years. As with other revolutionary movements, the use of child revolutionaries and the abuse has become an established strategy of the African National Congress. Good evening. It was so crude, it was almost entertaining. On Monday, two of the old SABC's news bosses, a board member and a black TV producer, came to the Truth Commission to explain why it went so wrong. We, we regarded um, SABC, till of course recently, as what would one call an Africana homeland. You, you, you had to have a correct same name to move up the ladder in terms of promotion, as well as in terms of filling new posts as an outsider. If you are a black, you would not even hope to be a lowest level manager. Being the public or state broadcaster, we ran a greater risk of being taken to task. So we had to toe the line. As you can see, Mr. Chairman, not an easy ride. 
Another important factor which affected the lives of journalists before 1994 was the constant pressure for, on us from politicians. Mr. Chair, for a period of approximately one year, not quite a full year, in my capacity as chief editor of News Strategy and Environmental Survey, I was requested on a two-weekly basis to attend a State Security Council subcommittee, the so-called Stratcom Committee. It is quite difficult to talk about this because the impression had already been created in the media that Stratcom would meet, would be behind many of the incredible deeds that were that were committed in the name of state security. Mevrouw Bota heeft toe bij meneer meneer Bota geklaar dat die SIK iets over Rusland gaan uitzaaien. Now, Mrs. Bota heard that something about Russia would be broadcast and the program was prevented from being broadcast and we were told that something had gone wrong with the soundtrack of the program because there was time required to convince Mr. Buerta and Mrs. Buerta that this program really had nothing to do with the total onslaught. SABC did not uh, mince words. SABC made it very plain, uh, contrary to what newspapers are doing in, in, in an attempt to, to duck and dive. SABC made it very plain, in, in, in written form, that they live to support the government of the day. If, therefore, you would reflect anything on the screen that does not lend itself to this type of an ideal, you would be in for it. It's easy for Professor Van Sale to, to point to those uh, um, uh, old programs and, and talk about the war psychosis. We were in a war, whether we denied or not. There was a Cold War, Soviet and communist spheres of influence were, 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 were applicable. Mr. Chair, it is already public record knowledge that I was a member of the Bruderbond for approximately five years until 1990. We made our mistakes, yes, I admit. If you ask me whether there was an institutional bias in the organization against the liberation movements and other parties in favor of the NP government, it would be futile to deny it. Of course there was. Was the board not appointed by the president? Yes. Would he appoint board members that would be anti-NP on majority? No. Who appointed the DG, the board? Would the DG be somebody in the olden days anti-NP? No. And did the DG not execute board policy? within a broad NP sphere of influence, so to speak. Now, I come to another, another point. The following step. Is today's board not appointed by the president and the same system not followed under a broad ANC sphere of influence? Then I want to ask, what makes the new board, Zulake Sisulu and Alistair Sparks, better equipped to handle institutional bias than the old board? They didn't wear dark glasses, hats and raincoats. They looked like journalists and they talked like journalists. But gathering news was not why they were in the newsroom. Their priority was not the front page, but police headquarters in Pretoria. They were South Africa's media spies. Journalists, because of their access and because they have reasons to ask questions, are targets of recruitment by both intelligence agencies and revolutionary movements. There was police men that were infiltrated and they had themselves as a journalist. I had a total agent. And journalists, informers came to a penny. There were many. And then there were journalists that unbewusstly there could be no normal journalism in an abnormal society. John Horrock, Vic McPherson, 
Craig Williamson and Craig Kutzer were all media spies. So help me God. Thank you. They're all guilty of manipulating South Africa's print and broadcasting media in a clandestine propaganda war during the apartheid years. John Horrock worked in South African newsrooms for more than two decades. He was a paid journalist spy until he went back into uniform. He claims to have recruited between 40 and 50 of his colleagues over the years. Many journalists came to me and approached me, in fact, from the rank of assistant editor on the Sunday Times, for instance, asked me to introduce them to the, to the intelligence forces so that they could work with them. Former intelligence officer Craig Williamson told the TRC how the state's information gathering network had infiltrated all levels of the newsroom. You have to see the, the state's relation with the media as a, as a macro continuum. It goes right from the owners of the media, the people that own the newspaper, the editors who control the policy of the newspaper, right down to the chap who can clean the dustbin at night and stuff it all in the envelope and give it to you. Williamson handed the TRC a copy of a propaganda video designed to discredit the ANC internationally. For example, during Oliver Tambo's world tour, I think in 1987, uh, wherever he went in the world, the propaganda videos and, and uh, publications got there before him. One of the growing number of countries plagued by terrorist atrocities is South Africa. There, the organization principally responsible is the African National Congress. Its present leader is Oliver Tambo. <laughs> The answer is that the ANC is a terrorist organization, an international terrorist organization, exactly the same as organizations such as the IRA, the PLO, the Red Brigades, and the Bader Meinhof Gang. It is an organization made up of people such as the Joe Slovos of the world, people who have been trained in the Soviet Union as international terrorists, have been trained in Cuba, and have been trained in the Middle East to carry out the most horrendous acts of violence that I have ever seen in my life. Vic McPherson, former unit commander of Covert Strategic Communication, claims to have used moles in media offices throughout the country. The Sunday Times, Pretoria News, Report, SABC TV, SABC Radio, Bilt, Citizen, The Star, Citizen, Sapa, Reuter, BBC News, Huisgenoot, Roy Roose, Republikeinse Pers, Republican Press, and Unsig. You say these projects were presented at the highest level. They were presented basically to the Cabinet. There was a State Security Committee in the Cabinet and this was chaired by Mr. De Klerk? By Mr. De Klerk. So you would say Mr. De Klerk both knew about the projects and approved them? Yes, he approved the... Uh, this fell under the counter-revolutionary project, and uh, he approved it in principle. Of course, he wouldn't know which journalists are working for us or the detail. What I would like to state is that some of these journalists still have prominent positions in the media world, and some of those who have left are still in good positions. One such person is Craig Kutzer, a former crime reporter for The Star who was recruited as an undercover agent for the police security branch. Kotzer, who is now media advisor to the National Police Commissioner, admitted for the first time this week that he'd been a spy. But his confession came as no surprise in media circles. Uh, on certain newspapers, in Carter, members sitting in certain newspapers within the Craig, SABC, when you were a journalist, et cetera, et did you work for the police or not? No. You didn't work for no. the police. Well, you came into the police with a higher rank for someone who didn't. Because I was a good journalist and was trained by the best newspaper group in the country at the time. Have you ever, before today, uh, disclose that fact that you were a policeman when you were serving on, on the star? No, I did not. Is it today the first time that you actually disclosed that? That I'm disclosing it, yes. Oh, uh, other see. people may have had, Mr. Chair, if I may add, their suspicions, and I think it may even have been reflected in the media once or twice, but uh, I believe this is the first confirmation. 
I have in support of reconciliation come clean with disclosure of my personal role as a security police intelligence agent in the media. The New South African Police Service has no agents whatsoever inside the media and has a policy of never recruiting such agents. I was never ideologically or politically motivated. The intelligence game, as we like to call it. I did not wake up every day and say, good morning South Africa, another fine day to defend apartheid. This is the English service of Radio South Africa. It, 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 it was a bizarre world, those years. Very bizarre, in fact. During this week's hearings, many men and one woman placed the role of mainstream newspapers during the 60s, 70s and 80s under a harsh spotlight. As the former editor of the newspaper, Frey Wieckblatt, I also made a submission. They were blunt accusations that racism ran unchecked through the newsrooms owned by the white press barons, that the mainstream press kept crucial information away from South Africans, and more, that they had actively colluded with an increasingly repressive government. The newspaper bosses who spoke were not from the old order, but they spoke on behalf of the old. There were apologies, but there was insistence too that they had a big part in the breakdown of apartheid. In 1968, with the launch of the Black Consciousness, a movement, I ventured into newspapers' newsrooms. What did I find at the Rand Daily Mail? I found black people sitting in a corner designated for black journalists. Mayekiso, Mujapelo, these people were put in a corner. They ate in a separate canteen with iron plates, iron mugs, iron spoons while their white counterparts ate from porcelain. I found this, and I objected to that. I objected very strongly to that fact that black journalists were allowing themselves to be demeaned. And there was more to that. The existence of separate apartheid-style newspapers necessitated the demarcation of newsrooms on racial lines, even if it wasn't said so in, in words. In practice, it was there. And the staffing of the segregated newsrooms was also on racial lines. And I'm speaking from experience, Mr. Chairman, because I worked there on these newspapers. Obviously, from this flowed the next logical step, that pay scales were miles apart for white and black journalists. Again, paying different salaries determined by race to people doing the same job was blatantly discriminatory and was an obvious violation of our human rights. I have no reason whatsoever to doubt the allegations that have been made about discrimination within the newsrooms. I'm sure there was discrimination in those newsrooms as a result of the law of the time or because of personal prejudice or insensitivity or human weakness. And I want to say, Mr. Chairman, that Times Media Limited sincerely regrets any such indignities that were imposed upon people in our newsrooms. But was there a policy of discrimination? I do not believe so. There was also some law which determined that while people of any racial group could rise to supervisory and management positions, they could only do this so long as those they supervised or managed were of the same racial group, with the exception, of course, of whites. This meant that there was a ceiling on the number of blacks who could take up jobs in the newsroom. But more importantly, it prevented blacks from taking up senior positions where they would have supervisory powers over whites. There is no doubt that had San or the male tried to take on more blacks on the editorial staff or elevated a black to a supervisory role over whites in the editorial department, someone in the production department, which was populated by conservative whites, would have blown the whistle and the company would have been in trouble. Our newspaper staffs were generally too white, and in the critical editorial area, black staff began to be introduced on any serious scale only during the 1970s. It is also our view that our company's newspapers made insufficient attempts to generate news from disadvantaged communities. And we accept the, the, the uh, charge that was made this morning that this created a distorted view of South African society as a whole. The legislation did play a very vital role in 
hindering the, fr the free flow of information during those days. And, but that is an excuse that is used by people who ran the media at the time for not, uh, as an excuse for not having gone further in exposing the atrocities and the injustices that were happening in the country. The media houses could have gone much further in exposing police brutality in townships, for instance, and they chose not to. They deliberately chose not to. They could have done much more to challenge those very acts which inhibited the press from doing its job. They chose not to do that. They, in fact, went into agreements with the government to prevent the free flow of information. I want to charge all the mainstream newspapers, every single one of them, English language and Africans language, with collusion with apartheid. I also want to charge them, Mr. Chairman, with having a hand, directly or indirectly, in the murder of thousands of black people by the apartheid army and police. I'm not off my rocker. Then the editorials stank. They were stinking, particularly on the issue of the military, excursions into the frontline states, mopping up operations, the one uh, uh, editorial says. The SADF went in and they mopped up. They cleaned up Lesotho, they cleaned up Matola, they cleaned up Botswana. They didn't say that pieces of flesh were lying on the trees. Why is all this relevant, Mr. Chairman? My point about all this detail is that if the mainstream newspapers and the SABC had reflected and followed up on all these confessions and revelations, every single one subsequent, every single one subsequently proved to have been true, the government would have been forced to then to stop to put a stop to, to, to the torture, the assassinations, and the dirty tricks. It would have saved many, many lives. And South African citizens and politicians would not have been shocked, or pretend that they shocked, at the revelations before the Truth Commission the last year.